Um, hi, I'm, so I'm Alan McConkey. I'm the lead cartographer at Stamen Design. Uh, I'm going to be talking about some history of Stamen maps, some work we did last year to update some of our, our very old map styles. Um, we, we ported them over to a platform called Stadia Maps. So I've got our Mastodon links. Mastodon is the new Twitter. And at the bottom right there is the short link, sta.mn slash TJ3. Um, I have a lot of r links that I'm going to be linking out to other things. We've, we've documented a lot of this work in blog posts and things. There's a lot more reading, a lot more um, other presentations we've done about this that please dig in and get more, um, learn more about this stuff if I don't cover it all, which I will not be able to cover at all. Uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll talk a little bit of the history of these maps. Um, these are uh, some some maps that have been around, Stamen made many, many years ago, even before my time. I've been at Stamen for 10 years, and, and we're revamping some maps that have been um, live even before that. So a lot of this is all a team effort. A lot of these maps that I'm going to be showing are things that uh, the, the people who preceded me at Stamen built, and then a lot of the work to rebuild them, which I'll talk about in the middle of the talk. So a bunch of my colleagues, uh, many of them are in this room right now. And then I'll show you the results. So yeah, the history. So Stamen is a, uh, we're a design studio where we do software, we do cartography. Um, we're actually quite small. There's only about a dozen of us. Uh, and we've been around for a long time. We're founded in 2001. And we do all kinds of work for all kinds of clients. So people will hire us when they need a custom map that they just can't get off the shelf. So, or data visualization. We work with um, big tech companies. We work with governments. We work with NGOs, museums, all kinds of people. Um, so a huge variety of work. It's always interesting. And uh, these map tiles I'm going to be talking about are these three uh, open source OpenStreetMap-based raster map tiles that um, we created in 2012. Um, so most of what we do at Samen, we have a preference for open source when we can. Uh, we have a long history working with OpenStreetMap data. And around this time, we got some work from the Knight Foundation. They wanted us to build open source mapping tools for journalists. Um, in, in particular, we made this thing on the left, which was like a geocoding tool um, that was really hard to do, not very easy at the time. A lot of uh, reporters would have a bunch of addresses they just need to put on a map. So we built this geocoding cool tool called DotSpotter. We designed a base map for it, and the Knight Foundation was actually really interested in this base map that we had designed. There were not that many open source base maps or even any that many tiled base maps around at the time. I feel like I'm, I'm trying to act so old here. Like This is not like that long ago, but <laughs> it was a little more than a decade. Feels like a long time in map years, um, or at least web map years. And so, they said, for the rest of this grant, let's focus on making more of these base maps with this OpenStreetMap data that was really just at that time becoming mature enough to really use for a worldwide web map that would work for, for all kinds of use cases. So we did this first map was this black and white one called Toner, which was really designed to be uh, um, good for, for print, black and white printing for, for journalists in that use case, but also just like really spare minimalist for putting data visualization on top of. We made a terrain map, the one in the middle, which um, Google had just released a terrain map around that time. People really liked that effect, and so we wanted to see what we could do with open source. And um, we did one on the right called watercolor, which was really trying to push the limits of what you can do when you have open data, you get the raw data you couldn't really access from um, a lot of proprietary sources. You can actually get it as a giant um, file and write all your own open source tools or use stuff that's uh, off the shelf and mix and match. What can you do? How far can you go with writing code that can manipulate what a map looks like? So this watercolor map, the one on the right, is just um, amazing what they were able to do. This is something that in all my years of same, and I feel like I've never lived up to what, what, uh, what my predecessors did with that map style. Um, they're, they're all beautiful maps. We made them all freely available. That was part of the, the Knight Foundation's um, grant. And people jumped on these and used them and put them in all kinds of maps. Um, it was really, we just made it as easy as possible to use them. So that's one of these, I'm going to have all these links to like other blog posts for their reading. Um, I, I wrote a few blog posts about the history of Stamen's relationship with OpenStreetMap through the years, talking about the origins of these maps. So that was a long time ago, though. Um, and we're not really set up to be a service provider. We're, we're a small design studio. People hire us. We do the best we can um, under a limited time frame. We deliver a thing. Then we move on to the next one. 
we do we don't handle like API keys. We don't really we're not really like specialized in like running these servers for a long time. So hey, this is a great free thing. People loved it, but over the years, the data started getting old. Oh, so, so, so much work to like update the OpenStreetMap data. Like, oh, parts of our AWS infrastructure stopped working because we weren't updating the code. Eventually, this map was increasingly breaking. So you'd like go to watercolor and you see there's some tiles that are missing. It just can't regener regenerate new tiles. Um, and it costs us a lot to keep giving this stuff away for free. Like I said, we're a small studio, and our, and our AWS costs, our Fastly, um, uh, our Fastly bill, is basically like paying another staff member to, to provide this free thing for the community, which is great advertising. We love that we were doing it, but we just couldn't do that indefinitely. And yeah, it just kept crashing, and things would catch on fire, and we're just like, well, maybe it's fine. We'll just go back to what we're supposed to be doing today, because somebody's paying us to do some other work. Um, we love these things, but we were sort of like in denial about what needs to be done with them. So we, in, we had this kind of decision paralysis in Stamen for years. We're like, do we really like having these around? Should we just like Marie Kondo them and just like say, we love you maps, we're gonna turn it off, we had a good run. But we really like, you know, they're kind of like, they're really old and ratty, and, but we they tie the room together. We really liked them. So we were like stuck this way for a long time. What we really needed to do was find some, some expertise, find some budget to like update them, make them easier to maintain, find some way to have the power users pay a little bit to support the service. Um, we weren't really cut out for doing that, but eventually we decided we gotta find a way to make this stuff last and make it work for real. And that's where we started talking with this team from Stadia Maps. So Stadia is a, um, kind of a, a web API provider. They're like a small version of like a map box or a map tiler. They, they will host your maps for you. You can pay for an API key and get, um, get some styles. Uh, and they're, they're on board with a lot of the open source goals that, that we really believe in. Like they're on the, the, um, the board for the map Libre map renderer. Um, they really want to be in the open source ecosystem, but they're also realistic about this needs to be a business. It needs to support itself. You can't just do this stuff for free. Um, uh, Luke Seelenbinder, who's one of the, um, this, the founders of that company, he gave a much longer talk at a recent State of the Map conference. He goes way more into the details of like the technical side of things, if you're into that, so go check that out. But yeah, we decided we'll work with Stadia. They have the expertise for hosting this kind of stuff. We'll update the maps. They'll live on this new server. Everyone will be happy. It'll live forever. Um, yeah, and there's technical challenges with doing that. So. Those were all raster map styles, so one of the things we knew, knew we needed to do was port everything to vector maps. So that's kind of how most web maps are these days. Um, they're more efficient, they're easier to maintain, easier to update, but it meant we had to rework everything. Also, those map styles, even though there were three flavors, there actually were 10 different, or 10 or more different raster styles we were maintaining. There was a uh, the, the toner, but there's also, you could just get the toner labels to put on top of, you know, stacking your things in leaflet. Um, there was a, a grayscale version, um, a, a lighter gray and a darker gray and so on. Um, and so yeah, getting all this stuff to work and, and also this, uh, the usage chart, this is um, Stadia's usage before we, we moved to them and then we can see the spike in activity, like we kind of doubled, doubled their traffic by when we finally started sending things their way. Um, we also had to just get all the data that we used before. Um, one of the special things I really liked about our map is that we had a null island in it. I had to go and find that null island shape file from our old repo. <laughs> and actually, I, I found a different null island shape file from someone else's repo and didn't realize that they were different until I put them in the map. I kind of wanted to do a whole, whole talk about just null island, maybe I will next year. Um, there's more than one null island out there. And of course, cartographically, like there's a lot of things we did that are possible in a raster map that you can't really get those same effects in a vector map. So how do we make it look like it's updated, like it's better, um, or at least more modern, but how do we keep as much as possible the, that great vibe that was there before? Um, so there's some things we just couldn't quite do the same. Um, we think it still looks great. It's gonna inevitably look a little bit different, but yeah, that's the old raster. Here's what the new one looks like. Land cover in particular was one of the trickiest things. Um, because 
Land cover data, finding free data out there, is also very sensitive to scale. So like one, a land cover data set that might work when you're zoomed out really far, as you zoom in, you'll start to see the pixelated edges, and then you'll have to like stitch it in with some other land cover source. Um, we kind of got away with a lot of that in the old raster map by just applying a lot of great blur effects. Like you don't see the pixelated edges when you blur your forest into your desert, and it kind of looks good, and it ends up like looking intentional. Getting a vector version of that same effect was a lot harder. You end up trying to apply uh, blurs to these things that are in vectors, and then you end up with this um, weird halos around shapes. Um, we, th we think we got it right, um, or at least we like where we ended up, but it's definitely not going to look the same. There's also just like classification errors and uh, issues anytime you're using um, global land cover data, like trying to get the land cover in Nevada to look either the same as Australia or different, or how are you classifying different desert classes and applying colors to them. Um, but yeah, so we, we posted a lot of our, our, our early drafts. So like this is in particular the one on the left is showing a lot of the weird blur effects that we kind of didn't like, that we just kept struggling with. The, the middle one is where we kind of ended up with the vector, and you can still see it's a little bit of soft edge, it still looks decent, and then the one on the right was the raster that we were trying to emulate. Um, the, the toner style was a little bit easier to do because it's very, very crisp edges. It was a lot easier to port to vector. Um, one of the things that is most distinctive about that is that the um, the typeface, uh, famously our, our founder Eric Rodenbeck loves Helvetica. I mean, we're, we're designers, we love and hate the Helvetica, we love it too much, it's kind of a joke, and then we keep loving it and it can become serious again, you know. Um, but it turns, I was, I was shocked actually when I went into the old repo and, and we'd actually been using Arial all this time. <laughs> and, uh, which is fine, I don't know, I mean, it's, there's probably lots of good reasons, but like we were telling everyone it's Helvetica, but it's not. So we're like, okay, finally, we can make it Helvetica. We can actually make good on our, our uh, reputation. But then we're like, well, Helvetica also isn't a free typeface either. Um, why, are we, you know, why are we doing everything as open source as we can and then go and use a proprietary typeface? We ended up uh, landing on Inter, which is actually way closer looking to Helvetica than Arial is. And uh, one of these is using Inter, one of these is using Helvetica. You can try to guess. Um, I don't have any prizes if you guess right. And all while we're doing this, we. Um, we were using this as an opportunity to refine a lot of the tools we've been using internally. Some of these are open source tools and some, some are still in the process of being open sourced, but we do a lot of this base map work. We've created a lot of tools that we need to have a nice, like we felt like we were, for every client we were like rewriting the same comparison viewer tool. So we just said like, we're gonna start, we're gonna make that an open source project, we're gonna start reusing the same one. Um, we've got these charting tools that will take a style sheet and explode it out into like a table. And you can see all your zoom ranges graphically. Um, we've got a, just a build system that will take a bunch of style sheet fragments and then combine the right ones you want into a bunch of this family of style sheets so that way we don't have to repeat ourselves when you're, when you're um, designing 10 different related style sheets. And yeah, um, we think it, it looks as best as we could to match the old one and improve where we could. And then there's also just these benefits that just come along with having vectors, which is fantastic. Like you can tilt and turn the map, and your labels are always remain upright. You couldn't do that on a raster-based map. Um, you can also tweak the styles if you want to, if you need to do anything, like um, one of the first people who jumped on these new vector versions uh, uh, wrote some front-end script that would go through and find every label language that we were pulling from the OpenStreetMap tiles and switch it to a different language. Um, so this. This map has a language picker, and you can't really tell here, but this is the toner map, but in German. And there's like a bunch of different little pickers there. In the raster world, you would have to generate a whole world of raster tiles in German. Um, now you can just do it really easily on the front end. We, of course, had people were using this stuff for 10 years. People had written a, 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 an app 10 years ago and like using our tiles, and then they forgot about it just like we forgot about it. And we have to like, how do we get those people to change? Um, so we just gradually started slipping in these little error tiles and tell people you have to go and update. 
I'll skip over some of these before and afters. Um, yeah, so you can all use this now. Um, you can go to Stadium Apps. Again, you have to use an API key now, but they have a very generous free tier, a very generous tier for um, educational and nonprofit uses, so they're on board with that, with us on that. Um, but yeah, if you're a heavy user, you should, you should have to pay a little bit to help make this possible for everybody else. Um, and I didn't really talk about watercolor. It is way too hard to, to try to bring that into the vector world, at least for this purpose. We want to come back to it someday, but the, the watercolor also, not only just what, showing what you can do when you have full control over your data and your stack, but what you can do with rasters in particular, because there's all of these image effects that, that, um, that there's like blend, uh, there's blur, there's edge detect, there's blur again, there's add noise, all those kind of things that depend on like image processing steps that rethinking how you would do that in the vector world Maybe we'll do it someday, but we just didn't. Um, but we do like that watercolor itself, the archive of those old raster tiles has been adopted into the Smithsonian Museum as one of their first collections of like an actual functional website. So if you want watercolor, the old ones that are not updated still don't generate new tiles, you can actually hit a tile server at the Smithsonian and use those as well. Um, yeah, and uh, let us know if you use these, if you want to see where we are going to go with this. We're going to keep working on these tools. Maybe we'll be able to create more variants of these in the future. Um, yeah, thank you. All right. We have time for a couple questions. Does anybody have a question? Yes. Yeah, so the, 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 the question of um, how, the, how the watercolor tiles are generated, the, the recipe is, is available but not documented in that we did, we, the code is still there in a GitHub repo. Um, we, never, we never actually like published it, published it so there's not, it's not well documented, but if you are curious, there's pointers to it. You can give it a try. I mean, it's gonna, it's gonna use, it was even before the advent of Cardo CSS, which is like the kind of the mainstream um, uh, raster map styling language. So it's like it was using Cascade Nick and like versions of Map Nick from, yeah, 12, 13 years ago. So go for it, try it, um, but it's not very well documented. And actually, um, Steve Gifford, who's who's a, a, one of these Map Libre people, like um, wrote a blog post inspired by some of the stuff I was publishing, like what would it look like if you were to try to do this in vector? So he kind of like wrote up a roadmap of like if someone wants to give it a shot in the vector world. Um, so you can also take a look for that. But no one's tried it yet. One more question. Anybody? All right. All right. Thank it's you all. the end of this session. So <laughs> go have lunch. <laughs> <laughs>